I'm Kay Bess, and this is The Beehive. Women in voiceover, the voices of the fairer sex that keep the wheels of commerce and creativity moving in this country. Voices you hear every day, but names you likely don't know until now. Hello, 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 my dear Beehive listeners. I must beg your forgiveness for, oh, the big lapse in time since last I posted a female in the uh, Beehive, Women in VoiceOver. Um, it's just been a crazy half of the year, and um, I've definitely been recording a bunch, so I have so many fantastic podcasts in the shoot, um, but I just have not been able to edit. So please pardon me. I take editing very seriously, and I have yet to be willing to hand over the reins to someone else to do my editing. So that means when I get busy or when things are nuts that, you know, that podcasts kind of get left in the rear view mirror. So anyway, please pardon me. I hope that you will continue to listen. I, uh, I will be editing more. It will not be another six months before I get um, another podcast to you. In the meantime, this podcast, I'm beyond thrilled to have the guest on that I that I have. We recorded this in March. My guest is Heather Dame, otherwise known as Heather Virgo at Atlas Talent in the Los Angeles office. So between March and July, Heather was married. And so Heather is now known as Heather Dame, but you will hear all the references to Heather Virgo throughout the podcast. So that's evidence of the lapse in time that has uh, transpired. So anyway, Heather really needs no introduction. She is, in fact a force of nature in the world of voiceover agenting and is a marvelous human being. And uh, I'm very fortunate to call her my agent. Without further ado, here is Heather Virgo Dame. My dear listeners, please welcome to the Beehive, the, the force of nature in voiceover agenting, <laughs> my very own agent. She's not my very own, but you know, Heather Virgo. Hi. Oh, thank Heather you for having Virgo, me. You're so <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for coming on. Heather Virgo is the animation, gaming, promo agent. Jack of all trades. Jack of all trades. Agent in the Los Angeles office of Atlas Talent. Is that, what's your title? My actual title is what's Director title? of Development Los Angeles, or VP Director of Development Los Angeles. I think part of the reason that we came up with that uh, was because when I came out here, I would develop the roster yeah. and develop departments and then hand them off for another agent to really, yeah. you know, take and run. And and so I did a lot of that. I do a lot of the development process and handing off. Fantastic. Yeah. So as it regards departments, mm -hmm. um, but also talent. And agents as well. And yeah. agents as well. Fantastic. Yep. Okay. So let's go to the beginning, shall we? Okay. How did you get into agenting? From whence did you come? Uh, so I actually thought I wanted to be an actor. Um, which I actually think I've learned a couple of different agents that I've met have gotten yeah. into it this way. Yeah. Um, because I think that we originally understand actors and yeah. the motivation for it and understand acting in general. So uh, I grew up acting and singing. I'm a trained singer. Um, oh, my God. I, I have a very specific ear. So uh, I'm very picky about singing auditions when they come in. I actually, like my mom, uh, was a member of a folk group my entire life in church. And oh like wow. the folk okay. group are my godparents, like all of them. <laughs> like, and, wow. you know, that, so I, I don't know these things about you. Yeah. So I grew up singing and, okay. and have that background as well. Um, and I went to Tufts in Boston. That's where I grew up. Uh -huh. uh, and I majored in theater. My dad was very 
you know, disappointed. He thought that I was going to become a doctor uh, like him and like my brother. uh, And I chose not to do that. Uh, So then I moved to New York with no money or a job and decided to pursue acting. Uh, When I was in college, one of my uh, professors actually commented, I took a directing class and I I did a lot of directing. I did a couple of directing classes and he commented on how great of a director I was, to which I immediately was insulted because he didn't say that I was a great actor right. um, to discover later on that really I much preferred the directing aspect of yeah. it. So I went to New York and I learned very quickly. I waited tables and, you know. And All those I, things that you, ha- that you have to do. Yeah, what you have to do. Yeah. Um, and back then, not to show my age, but back then it was, Backstage was not a website uh, and there was no castings on websites. So yeah. you would go pick up the yes. newspaper and you would look at the back of it and, um I was not a very good actor because I would look at the back of all the castings and I would go, not me, not me, not me, not me, not me, not me. And of course, now I know as an actor, you really have to have that instinct of, I can do that. Yeah. I can try that. Yeah. Why don't I try that? And I just didn't have that instinct. Yeah. So I was an excellent server. And I realized (laughs) about a year (laughs) in, um, I solved people's problems. I made lots of, I was really good at it. Uh, I killed that job. And I realized about a year in that it's, wasn't what I wanted to do in the long term yeah. um, and that it just wasn't I felt like I was had been stagnant and had hadn't done anything different and new and challenged myself in a full year and so I realized I had to move away from acting it just yeah. was not what I wanted to do for yeah. a living so I thought I wanted to do casting they tell you to get your foot in the door uh-huh. no one ever tells you there's like a door that's in the basement of the wrong building all the way across <laughs> town and it doesn't lead necessarily <laughs> to the building you want to be in. But I, I'm very grateful for the first job I got, which um, was at Judge Hatchet as a PA. Okay. So I began my career creating and producing talk television shows. And, okay. and that circuit is like they keep bringing you and promoting you and bringing you from show to show to show if you're good. So yeah. I did that for a couple of years and I kept getting promoted. I worked on Dr. Keith Ablo, Judge Hatchet, Judge Lopez, Judge Maria Lo- uh No, who else? Judge David. Hmm. I think his name was Judge David, Montel Williams. And then about three years into that, I just realized it's not what I wanted to do for my life. And yeah. that I was in the wrong building, you know, right, across right, town, right. in the basement. In the basement. Right. Um, and I wanted to do something that had more to do with casting, um, or at least that's what I thought I wanted to do at that time. Yeah. Uh, so I up and quit it and went in search of what I was looking for. And I actually got called by multiple voiceover agencies to interview, even though I was looking for casting. I had applied there. And the first one I went into... uh, So wait, I want to clarify this. So you went looking for casting... Jobs. But, but you got called. So how were you called? Well, I just agents? applied to everything. You applied to everything, and and the, and the VO agencies are the ones that called you back. Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. They're the ones who called me in with my experience because those sort of shows are like boot camp for the entertainment industry. You yeah. are like solving problems like nobody's business. I mean, I have the stories I have are fairly ridiculous and probably inappropriate for the show. The sort of <laughs> things that I dealt with and handled in in those series. Um, yeah. But it gave me a huge basis for problem solving and just making things happen. And when a hundred things are happening at once, just figuring out how do I how do I skin this cat? How would I solve this problem? What's gonna happen down the road? And how do I solve this before it blows up in my face? Like, and so that's where I kind of learned that trade of producing. So I take that and use that in what I do every day now. Yeah. Um, and that's a piece of, you know, what I view that I do for a living. So I went into the first place and, and they kind of were like, well, and I was taking about a 60% pay cut to do this Got it. Uh, in my late 20s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and I figured if I didn't do it by the time I was 30, you know, I would get stuck. And once right. you're making a certain level of money and you're in that job, it's, tra- hard it's very to hard yeah. to leave, especially if you settle down and you have kids. And so I, I didn't want to do that. So that's, I walked away at that point. Um, but they were kind of not really nice. And Interesting. I sat there and across the table from the guy and just thought, I can work for those jerks for three times the money. <laughs> And possibly more. So why would I work for you for that much less? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And then David Lyerly at Atlas called me in when David Lyerly was at Atlas back then. Okay. Um, and I think he was doing the beginning parts of the interview. And he called me into his office and I interviewed with him. And I had decided before I went in, I was like, well, I don't know if this is the right job for me or not. But, you know, I'm just going to be myself. Yeah. And so I walked in and I was myself. And he loved it. And he passed me over to Lisa. <laughs> Lisa loved me, and then she passed me over. I didn't know it was for John's job. 
<laughs> for, for being his for, assistant. For, for yeah. John's assistant. Yeah, yes. John's okay, assistant okay, job. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, because I met everybody else first. And then I got passed over to John and Haas and, and met them as well. And so I was hired within 24 hours. And the rest so, is history, as they say. Yeah. And yeah. so then about eight months later, they promoted me. I was much older than most assistants start out uh-huh. at an agency. Like, I wasn't 22. I was, yeah. you know, I was in there and I was like, you know, everything I did, I was just like a ninja with. I was like, dun, 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 dun. Because I came from this environment where everything was on fire 24-7 to the voiceover world, which I think we always think everything's on fire. But, it's but, but comparatively. Contextually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. not. It, it's it's not. It's a little bit easier, and um, and lifestyle wise, it was a better choice for me. So, and then about I think after they promoted me, about maybe a year, year and a half later after that, they asked me to move to L.A. Okay, so how long were you working at Atlas in New York before they asked you that? Before I moved to L.A., where I before I physically moved to L.A., I think I've been at Atlas two and a half to three years before wow. I physically moved. But they asked me probably my two years in okay maybe two and a half years in at the most wow time is flying yeah and i've been out here eight years or almost eight years and i've been with the company 12 years uh mid-april and i've never looked back not once so (laughs) well you really you have you have uh no disrespect meant to anybody else in the la office but i i i feel like that it you really did develop it I mean, and, and you know, probably according to your job description. Yeah. Um, but that, but that's what it's felt like to me. Like it, like in this time, it's quite a feat, you know, to be considered right up there, right at the same level, agent-wise, you know, as DPN and SBV and CESD. When you've only been here, you know, for such a short period of time, I, it's it's kind of remarkable. I think. Yes, but I think that has a lot to do with support because I've watched. I've seen a lot of people try to develop departments because, and I could compare myself to them because I was in the same scenario. Yeah. And, you know, part of the reason Lisa and John really wanted me to be the person to come out here because they were looking for an extension of themselves. They were looking for someone who was their brand person who, you know, they yes. couldn't do it. They they knew that they couldn't do it. Lisa has a family and yes. John comes back and forth as he does, but he can't do everything. Right. <laughs> right. Know, right. Like, he's only, uh, yeah. you know, he has to be sane and live a life. Yeah, um, exactly. And so, you know, they were looking for uh, an extension of themselves, of so someone to come out here and do that. And so they were extremely supportive. And I think the sure. thing I've seen yes. is a lot of people start, we didn't really start from the ground up in that sense. Like we started with this really great support system yes. and then ha- you know we didn't have an animation or game department and we didn't have a commercial department out here either so we did have to build those relationships from the ground up but we had already a basis of awesome talent who had been working and booking for years and you know and, and so there's just so many pieces of the puzzle that fit together yes. to organically yeah. create that success that I can't hold that on my shoulders sure that sure I understand yeah. it's just my job to yeah. laud you <laughs> well thank you <laughs> <laughs> so tell me tell me what the best thing is about working with voice talent. It's fun. I mean, every day is different, and that's what I like about my job. Every day I'm challenged. Every day I come up against something different, and I have to figure out how to solve that problem in a different way. I feel like coming out here and getting to develop the roster and the relationships and the departments from the ground up. And they were new and different departments than we'd ever worked in before. So we didn't necessarily have all of the talent at that point in time to book those jobs. We had people who could book those jobs, but we didn't have a full roster of talent in those areas. So, you know, when Carly joined me out here, we got to- Carly Silver. Carly Silver, when she joined me in Los Angeles. See episode 20. I don't know what episode (laughs) it is, but I interviewed her a while back, so. Um, uh, We, you know, we, really worked on crafting a roster of people and bring them on and being really smart and precise about it. Like Atlas has always done that. We try to be a bigger agency on the on the but operate more like a boutique agency yes. in the way that we represent talent and the way that we behave and our personal relationships. So when we were looking for talent, it was paramount to us that they were good people. Yeah. And there was so much conversation that we would have when we would meet with someone and be like, wow, well they make it's clear they make some money. I don't know if they're really like a hard worker and love doing this and aren't kind of jaded and not necessarily nice people. You know, we would have yeah. that conversation and it was a real consideration. And actually, like, I have to give credit to John and Lisa because they would allow us to have that conversation yeah. because they themselves, they say that all the time. Like, it's so important that you have people who you actually want to work with and be your team. Yeah. And so I think that we're lucky yeah. because we've had this chance to 
craft a roster of people that we really like as well as we think are really talented and want to support, you know, and I think that that's kind of the magic yeah. because it means you get invested <laughs> and you want to work that much harder to help that person yeah. and to work with that person. And you want to take those five minutes to be with them and you want to go to this extra event and you want to spend those moments and time on their career when you like them. Yeah. And you're invested yeah. in yeah. them. Um, it's very different than someone who's extremely talented, but you're not invested in. That's a very different relationship, agent and talent relationship. Yeah. So I feel lucky because I like a lot of the people we work with, like yeah. as human beings, not just as talent. Well, that goes both ways, you know, from a talent point of view, too. You know, it's it's nice to I, – I very much appreciate in you, you know, I've been doing this for, oh, my God, you know, well over 30 years. And there are – you know, areas of voiceover that I'm kind of new to, fairly new to, relatively speaking, right? You can only say that for like another year uh, or I know. two, I think. Well, no. <laughs> I haven't booked any animation yet, so. Oh, you're getting close. But I will. I'm getting close. But I am. I'm, you know, it's, and when you compare it to 33 years, it's like, I can teach, I can teach somebody how to do a commercial promo. I, I don't, I wouldn't say that about, you know animation or gaming because I'm still a student of it. But anyway, blah, blah, blah. That's are what, we always students? Yes, we are. We're always students. We should be anyway. Yeah. But, uh, but what I love is, is the willingness on the part of Atlas Talent as a whole to, uh, I'll just speak for myself, but, you know, I asked for opportunity and it was given me, you know, in the sense of, and I realized that what came along with my asking is my willingness, and, yeah. and right? So I realized that's a big part of it. But I think sometimes... I know this from talking to other actors that sometimes they feel like, well, my agent only sees me in this one way and I can't really get out of that. And, you know, so and and I do realize that that the talent has to take the responsibility of, you know, sort of being of. of I do have a thought on this, but I want to know what okay. your question is. Well, it's not really a question. It's just kind of a statement that that I that I am appreciative of the fact that the L.A. office with regard to animation and gaming, which are very competitive fields. You, when I said, I want to try that, that you guys said, great. You said yes. And so for me, for my, I'll just speak again from my own, from my own experience, how important that was to me, that my agent said yes to me. You know, I think in, uh, in certain circumstances at different agencies, because they knew me in this box over here, that, that I don't know if the yes would have come so easily. Well, you know so what I mean? think there's like a myriad of things going on in that one statement. Um, <laughs> one of which is, I and, and having spoken to, coming out here and developing a roster and developing, you know, the agency from the ground up and developing the departments, I have spoken and heard a lot of stories from a lot of talent. Yeah, yeah. So I have a good perspective on how a lot of talent feel. Yeah. And some of it is real and some of it is made up and, you know, some of, some of it is, some of it is, I, I, you know, I feel like personal responsibility is a huge issue and sometimes people don't have that and sometimes they do. But overall, I can have a bird's eye viewpoint of it. And I think one of the things I find first and foremost is a lot of people don't feel comfortable asking their agent in the first place. That's, That's very one true. piece of the puzzle. That's so I think true. one of the things is you may not have taken the chance to ask that because you were sure what the answer might be. And so you never really know if you didn't ask. But I've also come across people who did ask and were told you're not viable. And they weren't necessarily given a path to become viable or given a way with which to have that conversation and given like a, a space for that conversation. Right. So, you know, I guess the way that I've always viewed it is, well, sure, if you really want to do this and this is something you want to do, well, we will give you that opportunity. But about a month in, if you're not hitting it and you're not nailing it and you're really not getting those reads, then the onus is going to be on you to do the work to get there or not. Yeah. And I've had people who have chosen who said, I really want to do animation. And I said, OK. And I had the same conversation I had with you. Sure, let's try this. And then when the feedback came that it wasn't really that they were going to have to do this extra work and it was they really weren't quite there with it or competitive, they chose to back off it. And they said, you know what? I know I'm not going to do that to that degree. I'm going to continue on in my commercials yeah. in this area because I'm not going to book in this area unless I focus in on it. You're right. And that's okay. 
uh, but I'm going to do this other thing. And then I've had other people like you who said, well, then I'm going to dig in because this is something I want to do and I'm passionate about it. And now you are working in it. You may not be able to say a lot of the titles you're currently <laughs> in yet. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, but from my perspective, you are doing that now. Yeah, like, yeah, as yeah. your agent's perspective, I don't view it as you're a newbie to it. I view it as you're working in it. Yeah, yeah. You set your mind to it. You were willing to hear the feedback and didn't just say, great, now that I'm auditioning, why am I not booking? You right. said, why am I not booking? What can I do? Because this is something I want to do, and I have personal responsibility in this. You heard it, you took it in, and then you worked your butt off, and you deserve every bit of yeah. success you yeah. have. There's just there's all those sort of facets yes. of what's happening. Yes, you're but, right. But my viewpoint is, if you don't allow someone the chance, how can they ever find out? And a lot of times, people don't succeed when you when sure. they when you say yes to that question. Yeah. Sometimes I will say that you know I have talent. Sometimes they will um, nowadays with these casting websites. They will, someone in the middle of the country, like smack in the middle of the country who's never done animation in their life, will get a breakdown from a small agency they work with because, you know, Disney has decided to throw a wide net. It, so it's obviously an audition I have that I haven't sent to them. They reach out to me and ask me if they're going to be able to get it from me. And there's a couple different times where I've said, you know, to be 100% honest, this is a local Los Angeles job. You know, my guess is they're expecting people to fly in. It's, it's going to be harder to get someone outside, the, outside of that area. You're not trained in this area. It's a very specific skill set. I've yet to kind of hear this skill set in all of the different auditions I've seen you do. But if you want this coffee and you want to prove me wrong, I am absolutely happy to hear it and be proven wrong because I love being proven wrong. And I'll send it to them. And I have yet to get one of those auditions back. Usually they look at it, they start to do it, and then they write back and go, you are right. I'm not going to do this. And if I'm going to do this, I need to coach in it. Who would you suggest I coach in? That's awesome. You know, like, because yeah. they look at it and they realize, oh, well, now the game's on. Like, I need to impress her if I'm yeah. going to do this. And they have, and because I'm honest with them, I don't just say, yeah, yeah sure, here's, here's the copy, but I'm not going to send you in. You know, like, which I, I think is a dishonest way of dealing with it. I think there's a willingness to be truthful that I think most people are scared of yeah because when you tell the truth you then have to deal with the consequences of what telling the truth were um, and I think if you do it in a kind and supportive way most people uh, actors actually love it I it's very rare that I find someone who bucks at it every so often they really don't want to hear it um, but for the most part people really do want to hear it they want to have a conversation and so it's a little bit harder it's a little bit more uncomfortable it takes something to be willing to do that with people. It yeah. takes time. It takes, you know, living in a little bit of an uncomfortable space with people yeah. and an unknown. And and it also takes potentially jumping into an emotional situation with someone right. and talking to them about something that you most agents are kind of like, oh, gosh, can't I just book you and go home? <laughs> you know, um, yeah. And so I think that's why people shy away from it. And yeah. I don't think it's it's wrong. It's just not a way of being for me. And that's in my whole life. You know, that's not just about being an agent. It's just who I am. Yeah. So it's just what I, that's just a piece of who I am. And yeah. I, and so I don't shy away from confrontation. I've, I've been that way my whole life. Yeah. My whole yeah. family makes fun of me for that. <laughs> uh, so, so I think that's, that's, those are kind of all those little facets of why that occurs to people. I have to say, if there's something you're really passionate about and you're, and you don't even feel comfortable asking your agent for the opportunity, there's a problem there. Yeah. But my suggestion would be to potentially ask them to try you out for like two months or three months and give you the chance for that amount of time. You better be ready when you ask for that. Yeah. And if nothing happens during that time or there's no callbacks or there's no interest or they don't start to get invested in you that time, no problem. Yeah. But give you a chance to audition for three months with with and let them off the hook for submitting you during that time. Like, if you don't think I'm viable, don't submit me. But listen to my auditions for three months. Yeah. And give me a shot to show you what I can do. And if you're really that passionate, you're going to work your butt off before yeah. you start those three months and be ready. So we all know how competitive animation and gaming are, um, in, in particular animation, I think. Um, so it must be then that there are a lot of great auditions that come in mm -hmm. that don't get booked. Yes. Right? And so is it... You know, for 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 someone who's, um, who's I think kind that's of true new, of all areas of voiceover, it's, it's true. It is true. Like, what kind of a dork am I? But yes, it is. That is true. Although animation just seems it's like because people can do, you know, one person can do so many roles, I mean, yes. and and people get known for that, and they're trusted, right? And so they are used over and over and over again because because they're. They, they know that they can go in and do a role and do three more if they need to and all of that. So in terms of the relationship between the talent and the agent, 
Is it so much that I'm I'm not I, I shouldn't have an expectation that I'm going to book something in three months, but just that you listen to my auditions and you say, you know what, these are viable. Yep. That that's what that matters, I, that, right? Yeah, well, because if your agent gets invested in those three months and wants to develop you, they'll keep sending them to you. Okay. You know, it's more about your agent getting invested in those three months. Like, and whenever I've done something like that, like it's. It, I don't expect that person to book within three months. I expect them to work hard and bring it and really work hard and continuously bring new things to their auditions. So I expect at the end of those three months for them to be better than when they began. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're probably coaching and I expect them to go meet people and then report back to me about meeting those people. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. and and if they're not ready, I expect them to be honest with themselves and go figure out how do I get ready? Yeah. You know, how do I get there? And by meeting people, you mean going to workshops mm -hmm. where you can get in front of um, of a director? Of mm -hmm. a, of a casting I would director. wait till you're ready. Indeed. People often go away before they're ready. Yeah. And I have to say from, you know, I've taught some of those in the past. And when someone repeatedly takes my class multiple times, it's hard to see them differently than I did the first time. Um, unless I completely forgot them and then you're kind of in luck. Um, <laughs> so, it, it, you know, it, yeah. it, it, some of it is about learning. But I also think if you're going to go meet a casting director you really think you're right for and you could work for – you want to be ready yeah. to learn from them and be ready to be directed and be at a level that's viable when you walk in the door. Yeah. But yeah, yeah you can absolutely meet people that way. There's not a lot of generals anymore. Animation right. is a theatrical job that casts like a commercial voiceover job because they expect so much more than from you when you walk in the door than what was on your MP3. You know, in general, and they do, of course, expect more from you in promos commercials than just what's on your MP3. Sure. But for the most part, they expect something similar to what you put on your MP3 audition in commercials and promos. Right. You know, they're looking right. for something very similar to what you gave in those reads. Or if they listen to your voiceover demo and they cast you right off your demo, usually they'll point to a spot on there. We want the read right. to, similar to this sort of vibe. So... There are, you're, you're not expected to do five other things that weren't on the audition when you walk in. Right. In animation, you are with no notice. Right. And <laughs> That's big. That's big. So, it's, so yeah. But the problem is they don't see people in person as much anymore. So you're really auditioning for this job where they need a trust and a knowledge of you, but you're sending in an MP3. So, yeah. so yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a conundrum. How do you create that connection? You know, how do you narrow that down and make sure they understand and know who you are and trust you. I think there's such a high expectation among people who come in to voiceover that oh, I'm doing I'm doing all these auditions and I'm just not booking, you know, and I I try the, the times when people ask my advice, I, I just I just think auditioning is my job. That's my job. And I have to be fully invested in my auditions. Yeah. You know, and if I get booked, it's like such it's gravy to me well so the way it, you know? i i like to view it no matter what you're auditioning for you're auditioning for the casting director or the producer or whomever you're not auditioning for the job right it's the same thing in theatrical world yes, because sure. time and time again and as much as people don't believe this i have casting directors who will listen to auditions hear someone's audition over the course of time and when they finally get to book them or call them back they call me and they're like oh my gosh I'm so excited about this one because he has been making me laugh for like four months and I haven't found anything for him. And this was the one and I'm booking him. And it's a one time off guest role. Right. <laughs> you know, and so the yeah. talent, they're like, you know, they get that. They're like, oh, great. I got my first booking with this animation company. And it's a guest role one time with five, yeah, five lines. lines. Cool. Oh. You know, and, and yeah, to them I'd it be feels. So thrilled. <laughs> yeah, but to them it feels insignificant in some right. senses because they're like, well, where is this leading? Here's my momentum. And it doesn't necessarily lead there at that exact moment. But what they have to realize is that that person has been listening to their auditions for six months and laughing and enjoying them and tracking them. Yeah. And they don't know that. And I don't know that until that person calls. So you really have to view it as forget the specs half the time. Sure. Look at the character. Look at the commercial. Look at the promo. Look at what you think that's supposed to be and bring yourself to it, particularly if you're a little bit off spec. Right. Because you trying to be something or trying to give them what they want isn't necessarily going to do you any service because this may not be your job. This particular role may not be the one you're going to book. But the way that you audition for this one may actually lead to the job you do book. And if you don't do it as you and you put forth yourself in that moment, you're not going to necessarily put together the 
you know, causes and conditions yeah. to book the job that you're meant to book down the road right. with that company or whatever it is. So that's the way I try to view it is like, you know. It's a long game. It is a long game. Yeah. And so it auditioning is your job. And it's your job to audition for the casting director and the producer, not the one job. Right. And I think that's where people get stuck is, well, I really could have used that one job. And this is a full career. It is. In, and right. every day you are auditioning. That is part of it. You have to be in this game to win it. You can't just do this halfway or part-time or only for the big stuff. It doesn't work that way. It's the right. same thing as um, I, uh, I actually had this come up today. But uh, but I always... Oh. Could, would you like some more wine? Yeah. <laughs> Help I, yourself. I won't right stop there. talking. This is going to be a five-hour okay. podcast. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> <drink more wine. laughs> I'll stop talking now. No, no, no. Don't stop talking. Could I have a little? Yeah. Oh, you're allowed to have some more oh, yeah. wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> These are the best. This is only the second uh, podcast where um, there's been wine served. Oh, really? And the, and the other one was with Becky Reedy. And it oh, was, of course it was. Virginia totally... Hamilton didn't drink wine? No, she came at like Saturday morning. And she, so I don't think she was ready to drink. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking, I know. Yeah, my response was, oh, God, yes. Oh, yeah, I know. This is after That's a work me. day. Would I you will... like some wine? Oh, wine. God, yes. yes. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> so, yes, carry on. <laughs> I have no idea you? what I was oh, saying. Where were you? <laughs> we were talking about the long game. Oh, uh, and auditioning for the yeah, for the casting director and the and the uh, and the producer, not for the immediate job. Yes, and that's your job. It's gone. Doing that. It's oh, it's gone. gone. Whatever. We can gone. move on. You'll All right. edit it somehow. That okay, sounds smart. I will. It'll. It'll. Yeah. Exactly. I'm gonna keep this whole part in. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is why you know how to edit. I know. I do. <laughs> I know how to edit. I know how to edit things so that they're entertaining. <laughs> Um, okay, so so all of this began with what? What's your favorite thing about working with actors? Oh. What drives you nuts? Wow, I can't stay on track at no, all. No, no, no. That's how the, it works. <laughs> that's how conversations work, though. Like they move very. Yeah, naturally. I'm a fast talker, so no, it's great. People are gonna have to rewind and yeah, put me in like, slow motion, saying? like right. half speed. Do to not put her at one point five. Times. <laughs> it's not gonna work. <laughs> uh, what's my pet peeve? Yeah, uh, you, do you know, have a pet peeve. Turning in auditions late. <laughs> so, you know what? Like, I I want to say I have one pet peeve, but I don't. Um, because the people who want to be here work their butts off, appreciate what they're doing, and are there when we need them and understand what their role is to us as the agency. You know, like... I'm going to forgive a late audition. I'm not going to be mad about a late audition or a mislabeled file or, you know, like there's so much context with how you behave yeah. and your personal responsibility and ownership that there isn't a set rule of, of course, there are things that, that bug us. But I think when things bug people or bug agents or bug, it's because of the package it comes in. Yeah. Yeah. If that makes sense. Totally. Um, yeah. So, you know, because, oh, I know what I was saying before, actually. Oh, here we go. I remember now. Um what I was saying was, it's you know, I, I like to tell people, like, when you go on vacation, that's always when you're going to book that job. You totally. know, it's always that moment you're going to have to, and then you have to decide, am I going to lose this job or am I going to stay on my vacation? You know, and that's also the moment you go pick up someone at the airport is when the job that you really wanted in the area you wanted comes through and they need you in two hours. Right. And you need to be somewhere very quickly. Or it's those moments, you know, and it depends on the type of areas you're working in, but it happens in promos a lot. You yes, know, so when for we have sure. people, right. Well, people who work in promos know this, but people who desire to work in promos often really say they understand this and then the moment it comes to fruition where you know John or Lisa or I are calling them or our assistants are with a in panic that we need to fix this thing this needs to happen right now and they're just like what you know I'm not I going not be able to do that yeah you know that's the moment where that can do this and, and often you know it's always the lowest paying job Yes. Always. It's never, this is the voice of NBC. And, you know, here you go. You just book the voice of NBC. Can you stop everything and go ahead and do it? It's like, here's this job for a cable television promo that pays $500. Can you stop everything? I know that you're at your daughter's school, and this is very important because she's receiving an award, but can you just stop everything and go do this job that yeah. you don't necessarily live or die off this money? Right. You know, but the reality is that, you know, in those moments, that's indicative of how people are going to behave in 
treat their career in the whole because if you really want to break into that world, you've got to know what it looks like. And when your opportunity comes, you don't know. In the world of promos, that $500 job could lead to a $200,000 job. Right. And because you made that job work, perhaps that company starts to like you and they start to book you a little bit more and then they book you a little bit more and they book you. Half the jobs of voices of networks and people who are voices of, you know, and yeah. you know this, yeah. they like stumble into it. They book a one-off promo and then they're like oh we love that voice let's use that person for this let's use that person for this let's yeah. use them for that and then suddenly they're like oh my god I think I'm like the voice of Sundance like I have a girl who's like who that happened to she's like I when did that happen you know and it just kind of occurred naturally without purpose and she is actually an animation and game actor and she has to make that work like it's she has to really make that work, yeah. including like on her way somewhere book another studio get that done and then yeah. you know go somewhere else and so yeah. I think my point is, you know, when you have that kind of attitude where you're a teammate to us yes. and you understand and you can do attitude of I, this is my responsibility too. I have personal ownership in making this happen. And you understand your responsibility to us and what our promises to each other are. And then the moments, the, the truth, of it's kind of like a marriage in that way. The, the truth of those moments is when it gets a little hard and a little messy yeah. and how we all behave and, in those moments. Yeah, and do you dig in? And do you dig in and you make it happen and we're a team yeah. and we can both count on each other, yeah. you know, um, which it should be that way. It yeah. should be a teamwork that way. So I guess that's all to say like, my pet peeve is people who don't view it that way because I find it really difficult to work with them. Yeah. So it doesn't matter to me whether you, you know, if you're always sending your audition in late and I can't submit it, I'm going to call you because I'm your teammate and go, what the heck? I love your reads. Where are they? You know, I, often for me, it's like the panicked screaming call, like, where's your read? Where are you? Yeah. I need to send this in in three minutes. I need you. Oh, my God, yeah. I need you. You know, and that tends to be how that call goes down. It's a little less lovey-dovey and calm. Right. Right. <laughs> but like, less but you, nurturing. Yeah. yeah. But you get but you get the message yes. because you right. go, oh my gosh, oh, when I, I make a difference when I put my audition in, yeah. you know, and so there's, you know, so to me, like, that's all just quirks and pieces of it. It's really the big picture for me of, are you a teammate? Yeah. And do you take personal responsibility? And are you kind? Yeah. You know, not that everybody can't, you can't have your moments and, you know, not everybody's perfect, but are you generally kind? Yeah. <laughs> You know, and respectful. And respectful yeah. of people. Because we're all humans. Yeah. Um, all together, the producers, that it, you know, I know it sounds, seems like we're not colleagues because there, I think there are moments when you're not booking in an area, you don't view yourself as a colleague to those people. Like, right. I remember when I first started pitching animation, I didn't feel like a colleague to some of the people I was pitching. Right. Because I was like, oh, I'm this new agent. And they're like the head of DreamWorks Animation Casting. You know, and, and eventually that started evened out. And I realized we are colleagues because I help them find the talent they need. And the same thing as a voiceover talent. So in the end of the day, you have to remember, everyone you work with is a human being. And we're all on the same team. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if nothing else, we're all human beings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's huge. Which I think is very huru guru for like, you know, I think most agents would say those like detailed things which matter. But if they're in the context of someone I think is awesome, I will just call them and have the conversation with them of, hey, this is <laughs> kind of annoying that you don't you label your files like, let's fix it. Tim did that to me at the Christmas party like five, five <laughs> years ago when it was out at the Grove. Yeah. And I'm like, Tim, hi. You know, he always says, hi, Kay. It's how I just love the way he speaks to me. <laughs> and I go, hi, Tim. <laughs> Hi, it's Tim. <laughs> anyway, so I go, we're, you know, we're on the patio over at Wood Ranch. And, and I'm like, Tim, it's so nice to see you. And he goes, it's nice to see you, too. I have a problem with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, what? What is it? You know, and he goes, you're not getting your auditions in on time. And that has to change for the new year. It has to change. I want to send you in, but I can't send you in if you're not on time. You have to be on time. And I'm like, OK. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you know, that's because he I, likes you. I know. Because would he really tell you if no. you weren't on your team? The answer is, why would he? Why would he have a hard exactly. conversation if no, you weren't on your team? I so appreciated it. I yeah. mean, and truly, and I think, you know, life does bear down, right? Especially when you have kids and, mm -hmm. and you're trying to juggle people in mm -hmm. your life, in your world. But I think what can happen is there's a leniency. There's kind of a grace about it from your agents. But then you start to slip into the, okay, well, it's okay. So I don't have, like, you kind of... You you don't 
you sort of change it like it's the new norm that it's okay that my auditions are late. And that's not true. Right. It's, it's like, no, there was there was an extension made to you. There, there yep. was some grace given to you. Doesn't mean you get to slack. That's well, not the new that's And the, not the reality new normal, is that if you, know? you don't submit your auditions on time, you are risking not getting sent in. Right. Because sometimes, sometimes we just don't have Can't. that sort of, what, yeah. like that leniency from the buyer side. Sometimes we do. Yeah. You know, and, and that's why I always suggest asking on a case-by-case yeah. case basis. Yeah. Um, just because, and then you tend to know, like once you work in different areas long enough, you work with different agents, you tend to know which ones need their stuff like and are sending it out within the hour and which yeah. ones, you know, have a little bit more flexibility and what types of auditions. Yeah. I like to always put hard deadline. That makes which such means, a huge difference yeah, to it me. It means it's going out within half an hour. That's so right. if you don't send that in, it's gone. Yeah, you're out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love that. It speaks to me. When yeah. I see hard deadline, I go, okay. Yeah. There's, there's no like, okay, well, I'm like... You know what? It, well, I'm going to stop I'll at the grocery store. And still get you know? an audition back at 2 p.m. Yeah. And wow. I'm like, that was a hard deadline at 9 a.m. Like, that audition went out at 9.30 a.m. Like, yeah. and, I, and I actually feel more badly the talent spent the time on it. Mm-hmm. More than anything, I'm like, oh, but I thought I was indic- I was clear. You didn't need to spend the time on that. You're Because now I can't do anything with the audition. You just wasted your efforts. And right. I don't want anyone to be, like, I want people to be efficient and happy. Sure. And, yeah. You know. Make good use We're not of trying time. to torture people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So you've been in this business of show (laughs) for a long time. And I am curious if you can name something that you would consider to be a really important lesson that being in show business has taught you. You know, the... (sighs) So I think that there that some people have an innate talent to solve problems, like to foresee what can occur 10 steps down the road and act to prevent it, like mm-hmm. act to go, oh, I can see that these five different outcomes could happen, and I can see how if I just do X, Y, and Z, I've solved the problem, and I buttoned it nice and up. Um, and I think that the thing I've learned is when you are nice and you solve people's problems and make things easy for them, they will continue to come back to you over and over. That's like my entire recipe (laughs) for building business and and sustaining it, you know, like as an agent. Um, And it's successful. And I just, you know, it's it's not rocket science. But I think in general, as a talent, you can take the same, you know, viewpoint, you know. And I think some people are naturally just their minds work that way and other people have to kind of train themselves into it. But more often than not, I I watch, I even watch sometimes we have assistants or we have other, I I watch, I watch talent do it. I watch assistants. I I can watch the train wreck happen or sometimes I don't see it right away and I'll, uh, but you know, and I'll see it afterwards and go, I'll be able to trace it back and go, oh, well, I see where when you didn't send this number at this point in time and their email address at this point in time, but the booking was East Coast and it was, you know, whatever it was, whatever is occurring, I'm like, because you didn't do X, that's why this all happened this way. And sometimes it can like, you know, really, it, it's like, you know, becomes an emergency that now everybody has to spend a lot of time on yeah. fixing versus if you really can foresee those things in advance and solve them and button them up. And I think that goes for across the whole industry. Yeah. You know, then people are going to start relying on you because there's no drama around you. Right. Because you solve problems. Right. Right. And so the you know, idea that the idea that an actor can consider him or herself as a problem solver, I think is really huge. Because we don't, we, we view ourselves as artists who are desperate for work. You know, this is like what we, this is what we grow up with. Like, oh, if only I had this job, this, you know. Yes, like, but we have had talent hold on to jobs for years longer yeah. after people, like they'd have new creatives come in. And the That's new creative amazing. would say, yeah, we're changing the talent and then the producers would be like no you're not yeah and i had a guy who stayed on a network for like they they had him under like i think they 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 didn't have him under contract but they were using him steadily for three or four years and um it was like you know eight times a week it was a a, it was a very heavy job he was basically the voice of the network and they tried to and the new creative came on and said nope no longer him and they held new auditions and everything it took them three more years to take him off and even then, they still used him a little bit here and there because the producers rebelled. They were like, no, this guy solves our problems. Yeah. And right. he's good. Right. There's nothing wrong with his voice. You just want to change it, <laughs> you know? Right. Like, but he change solves our problems sake. because yeah. he was a home studio guy, a really great technician, and he would literally change mics for different producers because he would talk to them. What sounds do you like? What qualities do you like? And then he would find out what they liked and change his processing and train some mics. And he would do all these little yeah. things to yeah. solve their problems yeah. in post when they went to go edit his job together. You know, that the producers were not willing. There was like death grip. 
grip. They weren't willing to let it go. Yeah. So I yeah, I just I can't subscribe to that belief because I think right. you guys do. Yes, you know? no, I, I agree. I, I just think it's an interesting and long held belief. And I I think if you come from the from the realm of the theater and you come from you know, you come from TV and, and you know, th- there's this sense in which we think of ourselves as being not quite good enough. You know, we, ha- we have this ever-present thing in us that says, oh, it's not going to be me or it's, you know. And so there's yeah. a, there, there can be a piece of desperation where you feel like I just need the job as opposed to seeing yourself as a person who has a particular talent, who has a particular ability to help another person solve mm-hmm. a problem mm-hmm. just based on who you are and what you have to give. Mm-hmm. And it's and to shift your mind in that regard And they're is, either going to view you as solving this particular problem or not. Yeah. And there's like. It's not personal. It's not personal. There's yeah. no story behind it. Right. It doesn't mean anything. Right. right. You know, I, I do I do believe you are. I think desperation is it's honestly, I have to tell you, like it's something I'm most uncomfortable with. Oh my I God. get superbly yeah. uncomfortable around desperation. Yes. It's very hard for me because that's not I don't prefer to be around it because I prefer people who feel confident in who they are and what they do yeah. and want to treat me as a colleague. Like I respond better to voice or actors who approach me as a human. Um, we were just at VO Atlanta. Yes. And that's a whole bunch of brand new voiceover artists. And, you know, it's very interesting. I, I used the example when I was, I don't know if I was on a panel or wherever I was at, I was speaking. And I used the example. There was a gentleman I rode down in the elevator with. He, he, he looked down at my name tag. He saw who I was. He knew who I was. And yet he just had a completely random conversation with me. Um, I saw the recognition in his face. You know, yeah. I knew he knew who I was. And he just he just started chatting me up about it was not about voiceover whatsoever. And then when he walked out of the elevator, he said, have an awesome day. And just walked out of the elevator. And what I said to people was, if that guy sends me an email and says, I can't remember what he talked about, but, you know, I was the guy who talked about whatever in the elevator with you, but I didn't want to disturb you. It was first thing in the morning and you were just being yourself riding an elevator. But I wanted to send you a demo. I would listen to his demo. Yeah. Because to me, that shows a class with which if I represented you, that's what you're going to bring to jobs and to other people. When you show up with your desperation all on the table in front of everybody, my worry is that might be how you show up to the job. Yeah. And that doesn't work. It yeah. doesn't. It's just not it's not successful. Confidence works. Yeah. And you have to believe you belong at the table or belong in the room. Or it, if you don't happen to be in the room this time, that's OK. Or yet, that's OK. But you have to believe you belong in the Sure. Room. Yeah. So so tell me the difference then in your experience between confidence and arrogance. Confidence is willing to hear criticism and willing to hear reality. And and there's a difference between that and often when there's when you come across arrogance, especially as an agent, you hear someone unwilling to take personal responsibility of themselves. So th- those are not the same thing. Taking personal responsibility, I think, does show someone is confident because if you have responsibility of your own career and yourself and you understand that and you know you create your own happiness and you create your own circumstances and no one else is responsible for that but yourself, you're going to behave in a way that shows that to people. But if you expect something, expect if you're like, so I guess arrogance, I, I view as people expecting something given well, to them, which I, I think is not taking personal responsibility. So I, I'm thinking about uh, something that I think uh, we were talking about at VO Atlanta where, where somebody came up to you in a very different way than the gentleman in the elevator, but came up to you with like, here's my card. I'm going to work with you someday. Like, like, and that was kind of a. Well, I was at dinner drinking a glass of wine. Okay. Tell it. So, so, (laughs) so it was. And, and she just marched right up, threw her card down the table and said, this is who I am. And I, and I didn't have a name tag on. So I, I, I purposely had not picked up my name, name tag yet yeah. because I did not want to be approached yet. Yeah. <laughs> the night before. Yeah. Yeah. But she knew who I was because there's pictures. Sure. And so she walked up and she and she just told me who she was. I couldn't tell you what her name is at all right now. Um, I didn't keep the card. I'm going to work with you someday. I'm going to make you a lot of money. I just had to introduce myself. And I just said, OK. And Tim was with me. And I walked away and Tim was like, you have to be polite. And I was like, I just said nothing. (laughs) Like I just smiled at her because I didn't know what to say because I was like, I want to kind of tell you maybe this isn't the right time. Yeah. I'm a human having dinner. I'm a human having dinner and drinking a glass of wine. I've been out pitching business all day in Atlanta today and I'm kind of tired and was 
hanging out with Tim and we weren't talking about work. And and while there's a context of work, that's a, you know, it's a work event at the same time. Sure. There's still moments where you have to understand, would you walk up to, I mean, I think you kind of ask yourself, would you walk up to a celebrity and do that? And I think a lot of people do. And it's why I've never done it. I never will. Like I, anytime people yeah. try to force me into, I'm like, I, I just, I can't because I know that I'm not a celebrity, but in these moments like this, I think that's what it occurs to, you know, these people as. Yeah. Is it, and I'm just like, well, I'm a human and they're human and I hate it when people do that to me. But I think that that is more of a, I think that's more of a bulldozing sort of move that doesn't take into account that the person you're approaching has emotions as an, and is a human that might want their space. Yeah. You know, so I think that's a different thing than arrogance because oh, she okay. wasn't arrogant. She was very obtuse. scared and she was obtuse but you she say? was very nervous yeah and but you, you know, know what i mean i saw i, do, yeah. I saw that it, I, the thing that made me uncomfortable was her desperation yeah. in that yeah. that was a desperate move yeah because she didn't believe that if she sent me her demo later that i would have listened to it right. and she thought that was her one chance right you know and so that's the that's actually what made me uncomfortable about that yeah and i was like that isn't your one chance you know what there's going to be other chances and there's a chance yeah. to do it in a way that presents yourself that, that as my colleague and not as someone who's just, you know, I see her and I'm desperate to get this moment. And and I think that's how I view that. But I, I view arrogance more in the perspective of like someone you work with who doesn't take personal responsibility. They want, right. they don't want to have responsibility over themselves. The world needs to give them yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. I totally get that. Yeah. Those, those are, I think, three great, <laughs> distinct approaches, right, to an agent, right, at a convention like that, where yeah. part of why people are there is to, you know, learn from you. Um, and well, I, I guess that is, that's, that's the big piece. It's like, I'm there, I get to see this person in whose world I do not live, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so that sort of one chance, you know, mentality, right? Um, but really what it is, it's, it's, it's a, it may be, your chance this year to listen to that agent on a panel, <laughs> you or know, and, and to garner some, some information there and get to, and get perspective. And yeah, because that perspective might be the thing that helps you know how to present yourself in the long term. Yes. You know, right. I, I hadn't spoken yet. I'd only just arrived like an hour prior. Right. <laughs> right. right. Um, yeah. So there hadn't been a chance for her to do that yet. So I always wind up talking about so much about like, and I take meditation classes and I, you know, I do that sort of stuff. And I think that's very like, for me, like I wind up talking about that in relation to talent because there's a lot of talented people out in the world. But I think the people who really take take personal responsibility and work their butts off are the people that I just so appreciate and want to kill myself for that I always wind up talking about that when people ask me these questions. Um, but do you want to ask me any more technical questions about being an agent instead of the emotional <laughs> aspect? Sure. Is there I don't something know. you want to I, tell me about I don't the know. technical aspects? Of What's technical? I just feel like I'm talking so much about like being a good human and not about <laughs> being a voice but over is, talent. But I mean, isn't that, I, I, I sort of feel like that's at the crux of it. I mean, there are things you, you got, you just have to be able, a person who learns and absorbs and, and yeah. you know, listens. And oh over God, and over listens. again, I just tell people, people want to work with people they like and know and trust. Yeah. And that doesn't, come from trying too hard yeah it doesn't yeah it, it, perseverance is different than trying too hard <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely but again it's the approach it's sort of the desire to learn something new in and of itself for its own sake yeah you know and there's a confidence that comes with that absolutely interestingly enough yeah which i don't think people recognize that willingness to be vulnerable and the willingness to say you don't know everything right. is actually a very confident approach. Yeah. And I learned that in agenting because there are so many times, oh, there's so much I don't know. There's so much I learn every day. That's what I like about this job. Yeah. I, I learn something new every single day. Yeah. And you have to be willing in this job to fall on your butt and go, whoop, lesson learned on that. Yeah. And then the next, hopefully the next time something similar approaches you, you go, I've kind of dealt with this before. So I can sort of navigate and understand a little bit of this, you know, and you just keep learning and building upon that experience as time goes on. So you can deal with these new scenarios. Yeah. But um, even Lisa and John will tell you they deal with new scenarios every single day every they've day. never dealt with before. No, it's it's a really interesting thing to yeah. have done this for myself since 1985. And I am not bored. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine having the same job? The sa it's it's funny. It's the same career, but it's never the same no. job. It's no. never the same job. Nope. And I think that's why it's it's that's why it works. No, mine but, isn't either. Right. Because yeah. of course we're kind of tied to each other. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We're like in a three legged race. Yes. It's like right. the the most interesting actors I think in voiceover anywhere really are uh, 
are people who are curious. They're curious to learn something new. You know, they go, oh, what's that? You know, what's, what, what's the difference between this particular British accent and that one? Yep. Where people live across town, but they speak differently. Which is what you're currently you know what doing. I mean? Like, yeah, I find that stuff kind of interesting. Like that's, I'm curious. So, I mean, it extends to other things in voiceover too. It, but I think that's at the root of, of getting better, that you have a curiosity about life and you choose to go, you choose to go learn about it, you know? Yeah, but I think it's not about getting better for you. It's about really being interested in it. Yes. And so that's what drives you more than, I just want to be good enough. I just want to be good no, enough. No, that's very true. It isn't about, you know, I think that hopefully that happens, you know, yes. that you get better at it. For me, you're right. It's it's the it's learning the distinctions that I find so interesting. I I, I do. I find but that and really I think if you don't, if you're not finding that, like you're not curious in your job, you're not interested, then you're not in loving any it anymore. Job, right. Yes. And and any job. Any and I've job. actually said this to a couple of voiceover artists before. There have been people who have come to me before and said, "Well, I'm not booking right now." And I said, "Can I be 100 percent honest?" And I said, "Why? You're not having fun." Yeah. Like I'm not. Like you need to have fun again. Yeah. And I don't know what that means because they're, they're not necessarily someone who needs the coaching. You know, they're just, they've got that already. They've done all that. They have the basis, but they're like, what is it that I'm missing? Like, you're not having fun. You're, we, in agent world, we like to call it phoning it in. Right. You sure. know, yeah. but, but you're not having fun anymore. You're not enjoying yourself. You're not playing. This isn't fun to you. And if this isn't fun to you, your reads aren't going to pop. You're not going to book. You know, that shows through in your reads. Yeah. When people have every actor goes through ebbs and flows and that's part of that's just part of their you know careers and yeah. um, whether or not the trends go out or they kind of just go through a phase where they're like just feeling like. You know, ugh, uh, everything I do just isn't working, you know, and when you throw your auditions out that way. You don't book those jobs right. because it, you can hear it in your audition. So you have to find a way. Like, I would rather someone audition for less opportunities but love everything they're doing. Yeah. Because they'll probably book more that way. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, I say that to people all the time. If you don't love it, something else is wrong. Yeah. You know, find yeah. a way to love it again. Or shift. You know, there's always ways to shift in your life and career, you know. Yeah. Yep. Listen to that silence. Do you hear that silence? Is it possible? <laughs> Is it possible we have nothing more to say? I don't think so. You know what it's time for? What? It's time for Beehive Roulette. Okay. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so here we are about to play Beehive Roulette with the amazing Heather Virgo. Uh, and I have no so, idea what this is, oh, yeah, and I'm well, very nervous. And don't be nervous. It's just, <laughs> it's so, it's really quite painless. At least most of it is painless. So here's how it happens. So we've got the wheel. We've got the wheel in front of us. And I'm going to ask you uh, 10 questions, but you're going to pick them. And, and so I have 50 questions, and they correspond to a number. So you're going to throw me, one at a time, 10 numbers. And then we'll, you know, oh, is that how it works? No, no, you spin. I Sorry. was like, wait a minute, where this do I spin? Like, so that was I'm the, like, when do I spin this thing? That was th <laughs> Those are the old instructions for episodes uh, zero through Before 10. Before you got this beautiful Before spinning machine. Before I got my machine. beautiful so spinning machine. So I spin it? So spin. <laughs> You're going to spin 10 times. That's all. Oh, okay. Okay. So you can choose any one of those numbers. Of those three numbers? Yeah. 26. 26. Wow, that was really, that was my wine talking. What's your favorite smell? So I had two immediate responses. One was tea rose and one was gasoline. Not similar. <laughs> tea rose is like the, the, the perfume you yeah, wear. I'm, yeah. I'm wearing it right now. Yeah, I love it. Kevin Michael Richardson always comments on it whenever we're at an event together. It's just this like little $6 like rub-on thing that I it's wear. It's lovely. Yeah. It's like rose water. Yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. That's great. And gasoline. Wow. Did you know that there's, like, have you seen the gasoline candles? No. What? But I just someone did buy me a Christmas I'm, present. I know. I'm from Boston. <laughs> someone bought me, um, Marie Westbrook brought me, bought me this, um, oh, I love uh, her. this Fenway grass uh, candle that is my favorite ever. She now buys it for me every Christmas because it's my favorite smell in the world. Well, I'm going to buy you a gasoline so that's not my candle. Third one. But you can buy me that one too. I don't know if Jason will let me actually <laughs> You have to burn that. it in the garage. Yeah. So <laughs> only half good. the family will be okay with that smell and half won't. <laughs> that's for private time. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay, spinneroo. <laughs> okay. Oops. Three. Ooh, no, 31, because that's my birthday Ooh. in a couple days. 
March 31st? Yeah. Awesome. You little Aries. Yeah, yeah maybe 37. You're yeah. So a baby. <laughs> Don't even talk to me. Uh, 31, 31. What's your dream vacation spot? So I really wish I had one. We are I'm about to get married in two months. So anyone listening to the podcast, uh, in two months, my name will be Heather Dame. Isn't that a um, great name, Heather Dame? Yeah, otherwise I probably wouldn't take it. Dame Heather, I think I <laughs> should call Dame. you. Um, but uh, we are going to go to Costa Rica because we were trying to find somewhere fun, but we want to do things all the time and activities. But I have to tell you, I have worked so hard in my careers, in my life, that like, and I and I now live in Los Angeles. My whole family is in Boston, and um, they're in Massachusetts and and uh, Vermont and New Hampshire in that area. So I take all my vacations to go visit them. So I have like not really Drown. been on many yeah. vacations. Yeah, when I was eighteen, I went um, backpacking across Europe, and that still kind of is. And one of my best friends lives in the south of France right now, and just has had Poor two babies. Thing. Oh yes, it's terrible for her. Yes. But I haven't gotten to visit her there yet. So I do. I think that. Besides going to Costa Rica for our honeymoon, I would like to go uh, back to Europe and travel around. Right on. But other than that, it's like I need to discover that stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Costa Rica is beautiful. Yeah, I'm this excited about it. That's awesome. Okay, so that was the, your second. So okay, go ahead. Keep going. Eighteen. Um, what's your favorite ice cream? I can't eat ice I cream. Know, okay. You don't, you don't, you don't. <laughs> Dairy is not good for you. I can't eat cow's milk. I'm allergic to cow's milk, and I'm allergic to wheat. Okay. I have a really big tip for you. Okay, I'm ready for it. Big tip. Cashews? Not cashews, no. There is a, maybe you've heard of it already. It's probably old news to you. But there is this awesome place in Glendale um, called Yoga Ert. No. Which is like I've never heard of it. stupidest name. Okay, Yoga Ert. But it's a decade away from where I live. I know. I, live in dec- I know. It's a good 10 years from where you live. Yes, indeed. But if you're ever in Burbank, okay. it's truly on the border of Burbank. Well, maybe I can just make, some, make someone I go to lunch with in Burbank go with me. <laughs> I would. Afterwards. I'd meet you for lunch and go with Yoga Ert. <laughs> so let me tell you about Yoga Ert. It's all almond milk. It's made. Uh, it's frozen yogurt from yep. all almond milk, and they sweeten it with dates. Mm. And oh my god, what kind of flavors are there? Oh, like they have this. My favorite is um, salted caramel. Oh, yum! Yeah, salted caramel, chocolate. So Ben and Jerry's has been doing a very good job with their almond milk stuff because it doesn't have usually. I didn't know Ben so and the, Jerry's oh, have almond milk. Yes, ice they cream. do. So the thing is, the problem that I have with most uh, that up until more recently when Ben and Jerry started doing with almond milk is that everything's been soy, and soy doesn't sit well with me either. I, I can't. I can't do soy. So either. I couldn't yeah. do a bunch of soy stuff. Right. So I just and it tastes weird, mm-hmm. but the almond milk stuff is really good. The Ben and Jerry stuff is good, and it's all natural ingredients. It's not stuff like it doesn't have weird stuff in it. Like yeah. a lot of the things. Yeah. Yeah. that I had before. But as you say that, I realized um, I have potentially recently told all the kids <laughs> they could go to one of those frozen yogurt places because they had Dole Whip at it. The Dole Whip at, at Disney is actually dairy-free and gluten-free. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah. We're going to go. We're going to get some Dole Whip next Dole time. Whip is super now that good. We have so now that, now that we're talking about it. I know. We're going to um, sit in the tiki room. But I'm getting married in two months, so I'm trying not to. But yes. Th- oh, yes. It's, that's exactly what we do. When it gets too hot, we go wait in line, get the Dole Whip, then we go watch the weird b- bird show in the tiki in the room tiki at room. Disneyland. In the tiki, 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 <laughs> Which tiki room. really, like, you it's know, hilarious. it's not impressing anybody, but you're in air conditioning eating It impressed Dole Whip. me when I was five. Yes. <laughs> super. My mother loved to take so, me to so, the tiki So room. I'm going to revise my answer. Let's rewind back. Okay. Dole Whip. Dole Whip is your favorite. Yeah. Fantastic. That's great. Okay, so I think that was number three. Mm. So you have seven more. Wow. (laughs) Who knows what I'm going to say next. Uh, 40. I think maybe you just answered it, but what's your favorite dessert? (laughs) What's your favorite ice cream? Uh, What's your favorite dessert? Italian ice. Italian ice. Or actually, you know what? I recently discovered Rita's, like that Rita's shaved ice stuff. Oh, I don't know that. I don't know. It's a store, and it's delicious. Rita shaved ice. It's like Italian ice. Where? Where is that? There's a bunch of them. There. I mean, I live in the South Bay, so maybe so. There's some difference, but yeah. there's like there's one in Westchester. There's one out in that's Redondo like a, Beach. That's a decade away from me. Yeah, I don't know if there's one's close, <laughs> but it's called Rita's. Okay, and Rita's super good. I will try to find. They're it. not cheap, but they're super. Do you good. like? Ch- is it chocolate or do you like? Well, chocolate? so what I typically eat 
is dark chocolate, the Trader Joe's, those big, you know those big slabs from Trader Joe's that are like yeah. dark, dark chocolate with almonds? Yes. So we typically, because we don't eat a lot of sugar, we really eat mostly paleo. Yeah. Um, we train for a lot of bike rides, like yeah. long bike yeah. rides. We just did a 63 mile one last weekend, awesome. um, which we weren't prepared for and had a lot of climbing <laughs> up mountains, like up hills, yeah. but we made it. But so we try not to eat too much sugar, even though I, I like desserts, I don't eat them a lot. Yeah. Um, so we typically ha- just buy those big bars and we stick it in a plastic bag and we just like smash it. And then if we want, a little bit. We'll just have a little bit of dark chocolate with almonds. That's so. That's what I actually eat for dessert. Okay, got it. <laughs> Versus what I would like to eat yeah. for dessert. Yeah. Okay. Give it a. Give it a. Yeah. There it is. All right. I don't even know what number we're on. I just turned into a pirate. Let's go with thirty-five. The age that I would like to pretend I am. <laughs> you and me both, sister. <laughs> <laughs> Scary movie or happy ending? Happy ending. Rom com all the way. Woohoo! All right. Spin. Spin a game. Fourteen. So that like all these food questions. What's your favorite cereal? I can't eat cereal, okay? Gosh, you're making me feel bad. Granola? Like, and I don't eat granola? cereal. Okay, we don't, so you we, don't eat we cereal. We eat like paleo breakfast stuff that no one Okay, well would I have a fine. paleo cereal for you if you want. It's really good. Well, we but... like make our own, like we prepare it on Sunday night and it's like a yeah. It's a deal. It's yeah, a it's, deal. A it's a whole deal. It's a whole deal. Yeah. It's right. very delicious. No cereal for you. No cereal for me. Seventeen. Do you think you are strong? I guess it depends what it means, but... You can define it any way you want. But if I'm a strong person, like strong-willed or strong emotionally, like, yeah, I do. That's something I don't worry or doubt about myself. I think I have moments, but I... Yeah. I, something I know about myself is I've always persevered. There's any situation, I make it through. Yeah. I make it through better. So that's... I don't know why. That's just <clears throat> been an experience of myself yeah. in life. Well... And let me remind you, how many miles did you ride last weekend? 63. It was 63 hard. 63 miles. Yeah, I think you're strong. <laughs> Not just your, your constitutional fortitude, but your physical strength. That's, uh, that's, that's strong. That's strong. I, can't, I couldn't ride 63 miles. <laughs> we have to train for I it. know. All right. Yeah. But you did. Yeah. So, yes. Uh, can I answer for you? Yes, I am strong. <laughs> sure. Said Heather. I, am I done with it or am no, I doing more? two more. Okay. We'll give okay. you two more. Who knows what number we're on. I have no idea what number we're going to have to. You're going to have to edit this out later and just pick which ones you like best. 42. Oh, well, this should this should work. What's your favorite cocktail? Red wine. Uh, typically, I prefer like a Malbec or a Zinfandel. Yeah. My favorite Zinfandel is actually a non-expensive Zinfandel. It's an organic Zinfandel from Trader Joe's. It is $5, people. And it's you can it's an organic Zinfandel. There's yeah, a coastal yeah. Zinfandel and there's an organic Zinfandel, and it is delicious. And it's, and it's a TJ label. Mm-hmm. It's Trader Joe's. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I prefer organic wines usually because they have less stuff in them. Yes, yeah. indeed. That's great. All right, I'm going to write that down. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm telling everybody. I'm a big Trader Joe's. Don't. But they, sometimes shopper. they run out of them, and right now they seem to be out of them. Like yeah. once a year for about a month and a half, they run out of it. So if that becomes longer, I blame everybody listening to this podcast. <laughs> can I tell you who knows? Who really can pick a great bottle of wine? John Wasser. Well, I I wouldn't know because John has never bought me a bottle of wine. John Wasser, <laughs> are you listening? Are you listening? We're gonna find out. Sally Safiotti. Oh, okay. That woman came over. Uh, Sally Safiotti, are you listening? I don't know that I've heard about your wine picking capabilities, you know what? girl. I think she knows how to pick a really good wine that is like reasonably priced, but super tasty. She came over. We went to that's the, my thing too. What did Lisa Marbridge is actually good at that as well. We went to see a went to see a play. We went to see Bright Star, and she came over for dinner beforehand, and she brought two bottles of wine, and the, and we drank them. My husband was you know we're all having dinner, and the next morning. My husband was like, I don't have a headache. Yes. We drank that whole bottle. That's what this organic we, yeah. Zinfandel is. That's the thing. Organic wines don't give you a headache. Yeah. There's something different about them because they don't have all the stuff in them. Yeah, I don't know what that's it is. Why but... I only, that's why I prefer to drink organic yeah. wine. Yeah. Um, well, Sally can pick them. But also, I feel like right now that we have just been going out for drinks and not that we're actually recording this. And now I'm, I had this realization while you were talking that we've been actually recording <laughs> this and not just going out for drinks. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> Let's open another bottle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more spin, I think. I don't know. <laughs> God, it's so hard when you don't like the people you work I with. I know, right? <laughs> this is just miserable. It's what just a miserable so time. It's so hard not to like the talent you work with. Jeez. <laughs> 
Um, uh, number 18. 18. You picked 18 already. Oh, <laughs> bummer. 46. 46. Did you make that one? <laughs> okay, Rolling Stones or the Beatles? Ooh, the Beatles. Right on. I get that. Okay, I have one last question for okay. you. Okay. If heaven exists, yeah. what would you like to hear God say to you when you arrive at the pearly gates? Oh, God. That is a hard question. You made a difference. Right on. That's, that's fantastic. Heather Virgo, thank you so much for being in the Beehive. This is really awesome. Took me, took me a long time to get you here, but <laughs> it's completely worth it. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Oh, um, you know, normally I, I ask actors <laughs> yep. how they can get in touch, right? Oh, yes. Do you, do you take submissions? Do you ha how do you bring in new talent? That's what Let's I meant just... by earlier when I was like, do you want to ask me technical questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I, I meant. I thought you meant like, like. I meant like, do you want to ask me like questions that help with talent versus me being like, anyway, so I like love. <laughs> I love my talent. People and actors No, and no. Stuff. Um, so yeah, of course we accept submissions. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'll. I'm gonna put this at the end. Yeah, usually <laughs> via email is best. Um, so you want so you want an MP3 yeah, attached. So MP3 attached, um, or multiple MP3s. It's kind of like online dating. Be literate, because when I was online dating, I got a guy who wrote to me that said, "You with a U, then is I Z pretty?" And that was like what he wrote to me. I did not write back to him, and that's similar in voiceover agents. You know, like because we are going to be selling you, and so we right. want to make sure you can sell yourself. Yeah. So. Be smart. If you know someone and can get a recommendation personally, that's helpful because it helps us pull our eyes to your read. Does it matter you know? who that is? Like another actor on the roster? If it's someone that a we casting person, if it's or? someone who it, it well it does in the and the if it's a casting person or a coach or someone that we really trust and respect, yes. If it's someone on the roster who really doesn't send people a lot and we trust and respect, yes. If you're someone who sends five people a day, yeah, and not so much. There and I, my experience with that is that every time you send someone, they're not ready. Then I'm gonna stop listening to the people you send. Yeah. Um. So you know. Be judicious in that. And it's hard to get someone to recommend you because the people who are worth their salt recommending are very careful who they recommend. Yes, absolutely. Um, but it is helpful. Um, and it's even helpful just to talk about classes you've taken or people you know on our roster or just things that connect us to you so that we <clears throat> take those extra moment to click on it and listen. So what should the subject line just say? Which what, doesn't matter to what me. What should the subject line It doesn't say? matter to me. It doesn't matter to me. And it, it doesn't matter. Like, honestly, for me, there's no right answer to that. You have to present yourself well. But if you're recommended by someone, have that person's name in the subject line. Okay. That's helpful to me because then it draws my eye to it because we have so many emails coming back and forth. People don't realize that agents have like 3,000 emails a day sometimes. Like, that's Did you hear that? 3,000 emails a day. Because we have, I can't even We have imagine. breakdown. And there might be a thousand of those are breakdowns and 800 of those breakdowns aren't for voiceover, but they come into our inbox and we need to process them and put them aside and process them, you know? Yes. So it's not that every single of those emails needs to be responded to, but that's how much is, and that's not including the auditions that come in. Yeah. That's just including the stuff that could, that's separate. And the questions about the auditions. Yes. And the that, second questions those about are, the Those are separate. And also just to know, I may have listened to your, your what your demo that you sent in and not responded, and it doesn't mean I didn't listen. I might have listened and just not been interested, or for whatever the reason is, at that exact moment in time, we didn't need someone in that category. It doesn't mean you shouldn't follow up. It doesn't mean it's a rejection of you. Or if you get an out of office from an agent, that basically means your email went down a black hole and may never come back. That's uh, a good point. <laughs> like, if you are gone, if you are on your honeymoon... Yes. And if I'm gonna... on my honeymoon watch, I'm actually going to turn off. I have no idea what's going to happen, but it's going to be fun to see what does. Uh... <laughs> Trust your office mates. They'll be, they'll be crying and, you know, gnashing of teeth, gnashing of teeth and yes. screaming and, and, li and hiding underneath desks, perhaps. Who yes. knows? But uh, Or perhaps everything will just go fantastically. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and that week, um, it will be very hard for me to get back to that because I'm going to have an out of office on that says I'm not checking emails. So my assumption is going to be that anyone who emails me is going to get that response back and know that they need to reach out to someone else. Okay. Be smart about it. And, and, and you feel free to follow up. Perseverance does matter in that realm. There are people who follow up for months. And then I listen at that. Months later, I'm like, oh, I meant to listen to that person's demo. And I listen to it at that point. And I'm like, oh, 
they're actually quite interesting. And then I reach out to them. And maybe that moment was the right moment. Yeah. It, there's just no way of knowing. It's not a personal affront. I, we do the same thing. We reach out to buyers to work with us. And sometimes they don't pay attention to us for a little while. And then when they discover us and think we do a great job, suddenly they come to us all the time. And we talk yeah. to them on a weekly basis. And to them, the experience isn't that they were ignoring us. If I take it personally, I'm not going to have a very good relationship with them. Right. Right. It's just that until the moment they needed me, they didn't need me. Yeah. Oh, I was going to ask you one more question. If an actor submits and they don't hear back from you, what about resubmission? Will, will, will you listen again? Try to have an update. Okay. That that makes sense. You know, like if you if you just have demos and you don't have anything, you know, to really update us with, it'll be hard for you to submit again and just say, here are my demos again. But if you've just booked five national networks, you've been working your butt off, and then your update is, over the past year, I've been coaching with this person, this person, this person. I just booked this national network commercial, this thing, this thing, this thing. I'm starting to take off, and I'm realizing I need a bigger agency, and this is what I need. Could you take a second to take a listen? Yeah. That is a very different email than, here's my demos again. I am just following up because I had nothing else to say. You know, so it's, it's you want to try to find a reason to connect yeah. when you email people. So demos, demos, demos. Do you have, I had an experience uh, as a coach uh, doing a workshop where I, it was a narration workshop and I asked for people's demos before the workshop so I could listen and I could figure out kind of what they did and I would have the right copy for them and blah, blah, blah. And um, and my thought was when I got those demos, well, these people are good. These people are good. That's, these are good demos. And then when I got to the workshop, only one person could deliver what was on their demo mm -hmm. in that instance. So do you have some like secret formula to where you you go, oh, that is so overproduced. I know that that person, like they're hiding behind stuff. Or... Well, there's ways that you can hear it. But that's why we don't just listen to a demo and sign someone. So if we're intrigued by a demo, the next step is to either meet with the person or if they're not in Los Angeles, have a phone call with them and we start to vet them. You know, that, okay. that conversation is about just getting to know you. When someone walks into our office for a meeting, it doesn't mean we're definitely signing you. It means there's something that piqued our interest and we're interested in talking to you. Yeah. Um, and so I almost never start off that conversation. I let the talent start off that conversation and start talking to us. And most of the people who walk in our doors don't get signed. So just having that knowledge, it's it's a it's kind of an information gathering session. Yeah. So that's when we start to get to know you and get to see what's behind it. If we really like you and start to think there is that potential, but you ha don't have any work experience to show us that you are succeeding and that that read on your demo is probably real things or, you know, because I've not done this yet, but I just think I have this raw talent. Well, then our experience has been that that doesn't, when someone's auditioning day in and day out for you, what they bring day in and day out is very different than when they're specifically directed on a demo. It's not always the case that people can immediately deliver day in, day out, 20 auditions a day, the same level that they can bring on their demo when they're, they could have had 20 tries on that demo to get right, that right. right. So often actually sometimes what we'll do in those instances where we're like, gosh, we think this person would be really great to develop, but they've got no work behind them, nothing to tell us whether or not we're correct or not. We'll just throw a bunch of copy at them and say, send us your first take of everything. Interesting. And it is so indicative of what people, where people are at. Yeah. Because, and there are also demo makers. It's really interesting. There are demo makers who are really great coaches. And so you kind of know that as an agent. You know, that demo maker is a really great coach. So they really can direct that talent to that read. Um, and then there are other demo makers who are really great demo makers. But they're not necessarily great coaches. So their demos are almost extremely indicative of the level the person's at. And I actually find that, I actually appreciate that. Interesting. Um, because as an agent, I can hear the level that I know if um, who made your demo and I get the answer. I know the level the talent's at because Got I can it. hear it in the demo. Yeah. So there's just there's just tricks of the trades and things we know. But a great demo is fantastic. Can you live up to that demo? If you can't, you won't stay at an agency. You might be able to use that demo to get yourself signed. But in order to succeed and stay at an agency, you have to be able to live up to that consistently. How should a talent know when they're ready to make a demo? So I think you have to rely on the coaches and the people around you. And so you have to find honorable people. That I mean, that's the only way I can really tell you because I think that talent often just really want to jump to the gun and make a demo. But the problem is you spend that money on a demo and then you're coaching and you get better than that demo within a year. And then your agent is like, great, great, great. You need to make a new demo. And you're like, but I just I spent just that. Spent <laughs> thousands of dollars. Yeah, I just spent thousands of dollars making those demos. So I think you have to find someone trustworthy 
and you need to maybe express to them, I don't want to make a demo until I'm really ready for one. Yeah. I want this to be the, and, and maybe that's part of it because I also think coaches are people too. So they might just be trying to help you get there. And if you tell them, if you walk up to a coach and you say, I want to do three lessons, then I want to make a demo. It takes a lot of like chutzpah <laughs> for a coach to say, no, yeah. you're not ready for one. But if you take the onus and say, I want to coach and I want to make a demo when I'm ready, but I don't want to do it before I'm ready. So I really want you and I'm trusting you to tell me the truth because then you're giving them the space to tell you the truth. I think a lot of actors yeah. don't give people the space. They just say, I want to make this. I need to make this. I need to do this. Yeah. And and as you know, a lot of people don't respond, it's very hard to, in the face of that, when someone's paying you to say, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I can completely understand that. And so I understand how demos get made that way. If I were in that position, I think it would be hard for me too. Like, all right, I don't necessarily think you should make a demo right now, but if you want to, sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's your choice, not mine. Yeah. And, and so I can understand that. So I think you have to maybe find the right people and also give them permission to tell you it's not time. Yeah. Yeah. That, I think that's huge. Good. That fit the technical Perfect. Thing We've given technical it. answers to exactly. people. Exactly. <laughs> here, here are answers from agents that <laughs> actors want to know. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Heather Virgo, for being on The Beehive. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> that was such a sad clink. <laughs> That's all right. Cheers again. Thanks for joining me today in The Beehive. For podcast notes, pictures, and more information on my guests, visit the podcast website, thebeehivepodcast.com. Find me at my website, kbest.com. Follow me on Twitter at KBess and subscribe to my channel on YouTube. If you've a mind to, please post a review of the podcast on iTunes. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and good for the bones. Come back for more women in voiceover next time in the Beehive. Let's